Good morning. Good morning. Uh, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends, please take your seats. We start our panel discussion on data protection authorities in emergencies. It's a bit noisy outside, but I hope you will, you will hear us well. Then, um, we will not be talking about data protection authorities, DPAs in short, uh, who are in emergencies themselves, but about uh, their work in emergency situations. Let's hope that the, the people who are very happy out there will be calmed down. Oh, that's, that's great. So um, I'm Ivan Seike uh, from the Blink and Open Society Archives at Central European University. I will be, moder I will be moderating this session, OK? Uh, and um, Well, that's the, that's the acoustic environment, so we need to use to this. If you read Article 57 of the General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union, the well-known GDPR, you will, find, you will find 21 separate tasks of DPAs enlisted without prejudice to other tasks set out in this regulation. This is the official text, plus the last one, any other tasks related to the protection of personal data. And if you read Article 58, you will find 26 detailed powers of DPAs. And this is why uh, the data protection authorities, at least in theory, are involved in almost every area of protecting privacy and personal data. And this is why Professor Charles Rabb and I started the series of CPDP panel discussions on certain aspects of uh, the DPA's activities more than 10 years ago. Let's try the remote controller. Very good. If you take a look, a historical look from a bird's eye perspective to the, to the topics of this series of discussions in the last decade, you will find that we started from independence we went through, uh, through technology, through the media, the civil sector, and got to COVID-19 and now to emergencies. But I think more telling is the traditional tableau of uh, earlier speakers, earlier panelists uh, uh, in, in the last decade. Some of them are privacy commissioners themselves. Others are from international organizations, government agencies, business activists from the civil sector. One of them has even been elected to president of state recently in a European country, but of course it's not the reason why she is on this tableau. Uh, before giving the floor to the panelists of today, who will certainly be on next year's uh, tableau also, in addition to, to all the other colleagues, um, a few practicalities. Uh, first, I will ask every panelist to summarize his or her affiliation and main fields of interest in one sentence. One sentence, please. Then I will ask uh, Charles Rabb, who is the co-convener and co-organizer of this panel, to read his introductory notes. After this, each speaker will have six to eight minutes, six to eight, and uh, uh, to express or, or to present her, her standpoint or most important experience in the, uh, in the topic of this discussion. Between the individual presentations, I and also Charles may ask short, provocative questions to the panelists and we expect short, maybe similarly provocative answers without long explanations and analysis. And I will ask the opinion of the audience in, in certain issues uh, during this, this discussion. Then, finally, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, 
when you will have the chance to ask questions and make comments, as usual. But I will also uh, uh, use this, uh, this uh, time uh, frame to give the opportunity to the speakers to react on each other's uh, uh, standpoint made during this uh, discussion. So first, your one sentence self-presentation, self-introduction, please. Charts first. One sentence. Just your, intro your self introduction in one sentence. Oh, just now? Yes, yes now. Oh, sorry, I've been listening to the coffee noise. Uh, yeah. Hello, I'm, I'm Charles Robb. I'm a professor, now Professor Emeritus at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute uh, in the UK. Uh, and as Ivan says, we've been organizing this a panel on DPAs for a long time. Pilda, please. Good morning, my name is Pila Lehis. I'm uh, head of Estonian Data Protection Authority, and I'm actually I'm quite new in data protection area. I'm only worked for the DPA uh, almost four years now. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Chloe Berthelemy. I'm senior policy advisor at EDRI, European Digital Rights, and we are the largest network in Europe of organizations that defend and promote human rights in the digital age. Thank you. Good morning. My, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is uh, Zoe Cardasiadu. I have been working uh, on data protection uh, for many, many years from different positions, from academia to data protection uh, authorities. And now I'm working for the European Commission in the Data Protection Unit of DigiJust. Thank you. And for the record, I'm a senior research fellow and counselor in the Blink and Open Society Archives at Central European University, and my uh, research and uh, research interests and publications are focused on data protection and freedom of information, surveillance and resilience, memory and forgetting, and archivistics. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me in the back or in? Great, thank you very much. Um, well, this year we are focusing on DPAs in emergencies, emergency situations. Uh, and I think that's a kind of special category. Um, they, uh, there are many dilemmas about what to do with, about personal data and regulating personal data in the case of uh, emergencies. Um, they concern legal and ethical values, principles, and rules that apply to information rights and information processes. Uh, and these are, of course, often in conflict with uh, each other, uh, protecting privacy on the one hand and saving lives to, in, in emergencies uh, are a classic example of these sorts of uh, dilemmas. Um, now, in let me take a, a brief look at um, uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't want to spend much time on that. We did that last year. Uh, but during that, um, the statutory roles of DPAs were put to the test because arguments about the greater good and the public interest uh, were naturally uh, invoked in order to limit the privacy protection role. Uh, there's a question about how far that could, uh, that could go. Um, the, uh, the DPAs had to give advice to governments about this and to the public, but also to uh, exert their independent authority uh, and oversight over the processes of data sharing uh, and so on. Uh, but they were vulnerable to being marginalized in those circumstances and overridden by the imperatives uh, and the claims of public health and public policy. And there's a tendency that if you utter the words public health, oh, that's the Trump card that trumps everything, uh, everything else, especially in an emergency. So that's the situation that DPAs confronted in, uh, in that uh, pandemic. But in many quarters of the public, people were getting upset, uh, not the majority, but a, a significant proportion of people, pretty vocal, were getting upset about how their data might be used in the pandemic for contact tracing, for vaccine passports, and uh, all of that kind of thing. And um, many groups were saying that information rights are being infringed in, in, in a kind of area where we've never gone before, 
uh, such as uh, doing in, uh, in a pandemic. Uh, well, the pandemic is more or less uh, over, but further ones are likely to occur. Further situations of that kind involving personal data and data sharing are likely to occur. Uh, and besides which, there have been a whole range of emergencies and disasters, such as earthquakes, um, tsunamis, flooding, uh, famines, and droughts, which test the effectiveness and the relevance of the rules regarding personal data. And they put a strain on everyone's, not only DPA's, ability to safeguard personal data while also locating and, and uh, rescuing people, saving lives, reuniting families, and so on. Uh, and the same is true of man-made disasters, wars, uh, terrorist uh, uh, um, uh, attacks, and the political displacement and migration of peoples. Um, now, humanitarian relief efforts, of course, have to work in those sorts of situations, whether natural or man-made disasters, uh, and issues around the role of personal data are implicated in those situations. Identifying people whose papers and documents have been lost or who have been physically displaced is part of a scenario that brings into focus the question of proving who you are and incorporates issues of data, issues of remembering, and issues about forgetting and the good and bad consequences uh, of, of all of that. DPAs are, of course, important actors in this. They have to re-examine their own preparedness to make decisions in those difficult uh, um, uh, uh, situations, and also consider the legal and the ethical scope and limits of their ability to take initiatives and not only react to the policies uh, uh, and pressures. Uh, and equally, policymakers and governments have to consider the legal lines in which they are uh, adopting measures uh, in, um, uh, in, in situations of, of disasters or, or emergencies, including uh, pandemics. DPAs may have to coordinate their relationships with each other and with the many organizations and communities uh, of interest uh, that are involved in it. These communities include uh, health professionals, safety and rescue specialists, governments, industry, scientific researchers, civil society organizations, and representatives of the public. And as, mentioned, as I mentioned, the international dimension is uh, very important because the effects of emergencies and various kinds of disaster don't respect national boundaries. They spill over, and therefore coordination of, of, of uh, relief efforts, for example, have to be done uh, across data, uh, across borders, uh, in, through organizations that may have different takes and different legal rules applying to what you can do uh, with, uh, with data. So that's, that's the difficult situation. Now, what's the legislative, uh, the legal uh, the, uh, uh, situation applying to all of this, including the GPR? Well, um, there is relevant legislation which may f permit or forbid activities of government and relief organizations in communicating information or sharing data about persons uh, who, uh, who are in trouble or who are missing. Um, there may be a lack of, 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 adequate, of an adequacy, adequacy decision which may inhibit the exchange of data across uh, national boundaries. And also, particularly, the need to act very speedily it may make it very difficult or impossible to obtain either legal clearance or, in most situations, consent uh, for, um, uh, for the handling and the processing and sharing in data, uh, sharing data. So the breaches of privacy uh, are, are, are likely to occur. And there's a need, therefore, for preparatory activity, such as guidelines, the clear drafting of legal regulations, and other measures that can cover such situations. Now, let me move from that abstraction to look at some of the history very, very briefly. Um, a few examples can be referred to. Uh, let's take Australia uh, back in uh, 2002, when there were bombings in Bali, which affected many hundreds of people, uh, and again in 2004, when the tsunami in Southeast Asia killed over 200 million people. Australians were involved because a lot of Australian citizens were in Bali or were in other countries in Southeast Asia where the tsunami uh, 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 took effect. Now, the Australian Privacy Act at that time obstructed the Red Cross in accessing government-held data on missing and deceased persons, and it cut across the relief uh, uh, and assistance efforts. 
Uh, the Red Cross found that it had to make up its own list of people, but it couldn't share those with the Australian state and territorial organizations, and they were unable, of course, to get people's consent. After the 2004 tsunami, there were again uh, similar obstacles, and the government couldn't share data with private sector organizations such as airlines to see who was possibly flying uh, back to Australia uh, or should have been on flights and so on. At that time, the Federal Privacy Commission in Australia believed that the health and safety exceptions in the Act couldn't be used to cover the activity about natural disasters like that. So in the following year, they changed the law following the commission's recommendation. And the law then allowed the government legally to issue time-limited emergency declarations to permit data processing in such circumstances. The question of time-limited, uh, I think, is crucial. In New Zealand, following the Christchurch earthquake of 2011, the government again declared a national emergency, but it was unclear whether the Privacy Act's exceptions were available for overriding privacy principles at that time. But the Privacy Commissioner, who was Marie Schroff, used her interpretive power under the Act to issue, once again, a temporary discretionary uh, information sharing code so that the agencies in New Zealand could share data uh, under, uh, legally. And that was modeled on the Australian precedent. More recently, there's been some more policy activity uh, at the international level uh, as well. In 2011, the 33rd International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners uh, was held in Mexico City. I don't know whether anyone attended. I happened to be there. Uh, it was a lovely occasion. And they adapted, uh, adopted a resolution on data protection and major natural disasters, which is worth looking at. It's very short. And it made recommendations for governments, for DPAs, and for others uh, about what to do, how to anticipate and act in emergencies. For DPAs, it cited the Australian episode, and it called upon DPAs to review whether the laws under which they operate are equal to the conditions that may be created by a major natural disaster, and to review their own preparations and guidance that they give to organizations that might, may be involved in relief operations or whatever the case, whatever the case may be. Um, now, the GDPR, let me come to that. Um, Article 23 of the GDPR, along with Recital 73, allows member states to restrict a range of information rights, quote, when such a restriction respects the essence of the fundamental rights and freedoms and is a necessary and proportionate measure in a democratic society to safeguard several overriding public interest objectives, including public security, national security. Now, in the first year of the COVID, uh, the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, issued a statement in June of 2020. Now, why did they do this? They had been provoked by the Hungarian government's derogation from upholding these data subject information rights specified in Articles 15 to 22 of the GDPR in the context of pandemic data processing. Hungary described that as a state of danger but the Hungarian government derogated from uh, from the uh, uh, fr from the uh, uh, the rights um, for an unlimited time, not a time limit, but unlimited time until the danger would have ended. So it was an open-ended condition, which brought the EDPB's attention, uh, brought to the EDPB's attention by the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union and others. So the EDPB's statement called this situation, a state of emergency, by which it meant, and listen to these words, any kind of exceptional state adopted at national level to fight against pandemics. Now forget the word pandemics and think of, of tsunamis and other disasters. You have the event, but you also have a declaration, uh, the event which is exceptional, but also the government's derogations are exceptional. So here you have two emergencies, two exceptionalities, uh, if you like. It drew attention, therefore, uh, the uh, EDPB, to the wider idea of what is an emergency, what is an exception, who is to declare it to be an emergency, uh, when and how and by whom is an emergency deemed to be over and done with 
uh, by and large. These are some of the, the issues that cause concern when governments without time limit try to restrict the uh, enforcement of, of, uh, of rights. Um, so the EDPB uh, emphasized that even in these exceptional times, we can't throw away the rights, we can't throw away the, uh, the data protection, uh, and even where it is where there's an overriding interest in saving lives, public safety, and, uh, uh, and so on, that therefore you still have to show necessity and proportionality and be strictly limited in time and limited to the emergency state that you have declared as policy by, uh, that the government has declared to be uh, part of the situation. Um, and later on, the EDPB consulted on guidelines at the end of 2020 uh, on what, uh, restrictions to Article 23. I don't have time to go into those uh, very much, but briefly, again, it defended the protection of personal data. Uh, and it also said that um, you need to, if you have an unlimited time for an emergency, it doesn't meet the foreseeable, foreseeability criterion, which is very important. Now, where else can we find uh, these issues in the GDPR? Well, Article 6, 1D of the GDPR it talks about vital interests uh, and, um, uh, and recital 46 as well. And vital interests include things that are essential for someone's life, and that would cover the processing of personal data in situations of many kinds. So you could refer to the vital interests section of uh, the uh, GDPR to learn more, uh, learn more about that. Um, coming now to my, close to my conclusion, um, if you move beyond emergencies as such, you will then widen the landscape a little bit. And the specific area is the question of the privacy of missing persons. There's a very interesting report produced by the late Joel Reidenberg and uh, Bob Gelman uh, some years ago for Fordham University, in which they talk about data protection concerning missing persons. I would encourage you to find that and, uh, and read it because it's very relevant and also relevant to Article 49 of the, e of the uh, GDPR. Missing persons actually is a label for a very broad category of people that goes beyond those who may be missing, unidentified, and unidentifiable as a result of emergencies and disasters. Maybe not today, but we could go into the outer reaches of this category of missing persons to consider how to protect the rights, including information rights, of those who, for one reason or another, decide to disappear or do not need or do not want to be rescued or identified, and who are perhaps performing the ultimate act of the right to be forgotten. They have rights too. So we're not just talking about the necessity to find missing persons, to identify them, and all the rest. We're talking about people who have chosen not to be identified. Well, let me conclude. What lessons are DPAs learning from their experience and from that of others with safeguarding privacy and personal data in the midst of emergencies? Have they sufficient resilience and scope to anticipate and deal with the pressing issues that emergencies may bring and to learn also from each other? Who else needs to learn these lessons and to share their own experiences with DPAs in collaborative efforts to do it better next time? And this is now where we move over to the rest of the panel to discuss things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for your overview and analysis of, of this topic. Your examples from Australia and New Zealand were um, uh, particularly important, uh, showing also the global nature of these issues. Um, and now, you will have a chance to vote. Who are familiar uh, with the traditions and the style of uh, our our panel discussions will not be surprised. So you will have a chance to vote to certain sim simple, maybe oversimplified questions, simply by raising your hand. So the first question is the following. Do you think DPAs should be able to intervene, either to permit or to prevent relief and rescue organizations from accessing personal data in emergencies? Option one, yes. They should be able to intervene if they deem it necessary. Option two, no, 
in such situations, the work of relief and rescue organizations must have absolute priority. And option three, only in special cases. So who votes for option one? Please raise your hands. More than half. Thank you. Who votes for option two? One. Yes. Very brave. Thank you. And who votes for option three? A few. That's, that's the, the minority. And maybe some abstained because uh, you, you thought the, the, the question is too oversimplified. OK, thank you. We took note of this. So now uh, I would, and maybe if we have time, we can get back to, to these questions. So a warming up question to Pilla, if I may. Uh, Estonia is regarded as a model country in e-government and e-business services. In your opinion, is it an advantage or a disadvantage with regard to personal, pri uh, personal privacy, protection of personal data? I must say both. <laughs> OK, thank you. That, that was really <laughs> short. Thank you. This is when the hangman is hanged. OK, so the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me here. It's uh, my first, uh, first experience in this conference, so I'm very honored. And uh, to get to the uh, topic, I, I first I must explain how uh, this uh, uh, very modern system uh, in Estonia works, I mean, the data exchange uh, system on the government level. And uh, I'm sorry, I cannot avoid the uh, COVID crisis situation. So you have to listen our experience from that. Um, so in Estonia, every state database uh, is established by law. Uh, the requirements, uh, requirement uh, that privacy can only be infringed uh, by law comes uh, actually from our constitution. Each database has its own statute, uh, which stipulates the purpose and uh, scope of data collection, as well who submits data to the database and who can receive data from database. Uh, this statute is a government regulation uh, general reg requirements of database should be laid down by law, and more precise requirements can be stipulated by regulation of government. government. So uh, data exchange takes place via the secure data exchange platform called XROAD, uh, where the data exchange is, uh, is encrypted and protected. Uh, we are very proud of uh, this uh, system, and uh, for a good reason, it generally works perfectly. In the last major emergency, the COVID crisis, we discovered that this uh, system also has its own shortcomings. Uh, as mentioned, each, uh, each database has its own regulation to, uh, that define the purpose of data collection and specify who can access and provide data. The law must stipulate for which public task the public sector institution may use uh, this data. But then, uh, in a crisis situation, we discovered that uh, it is necessary to exchange data between different parties than usual. We, we discovered that many databases that should exchange data cannot do so uh, because the current law does not allow it. Uh, there was also a problem with the redistribution of tasks uh, between uh, different institutions. For example, when the uh, Board of Health was uh, overloaded with work. Uh, they wanted to give uh, certain tasks to the health insurance fund. Uh, however, since the he health insurance fund does not have such a task by law, and even if it had the data, but collected for one pur purpose, they couldn't use it for another purpose. Uh, so we, as the Data Protection Authority, were under great pressure to give so-called permission uh, to allow different data exchanges, which we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't take the role of the legislator or give the permission to something which the legislation does not allow, actually. Uh, of course, we re received a lot of criticism because of that, that we are working against the operator resolutions uh, of the crisis, that we need to see the bigger picture and things like that. However, we remain convinced that uh, fundamental rights uh, must be respected, uh, respected uh, even in an emergency. Um, 
but of course there were also like good examples. Uh, for example, it was necessary to co conduct a mobility study, which uh, the statistics Estonia wanted to carry out. But uh, telecommunication companies uh, did not have a legal basis to release the personal mobility data to Statistics Estonia. Uh, but at the same time, the telcos themselves had a legal basis to carry out uh, that kind of uh, study and, and pr process that data. So then the uh, private sector came to help uh, us out uh, and did the study itself and uh, only is issued the results to the government. Um, and also, uh, although we discussed that after the end of the crisis, uh, the data exchange between databases and, and legal regulations governing data exchange should be reviewed, uh, in order to avoid this, uh, the same situation next time. Unfortunately, we have not reached that point yet. Uh, the first steps still um, have been taken and, and general authorization norms in the law have been uh, revised. Um, however, it was understood that the government actually needs more data to make uh, decisions in a crisis uh, situation as well in an uh, everyday situation, of course. For today, a data-based uh, decision-making project has been launched in Estonia at the government level, level to develop uh, solutions for how the government could use the data which uh, state already has to make uh, faster and more accurate decisions based on, on data rather than intuition. Um, and what else, uh, good, good example I can uh, tell is that um, uh, data processing, processing transpar transparency in state uh, databases um, is guaranteed to the citizens uh, through a data tracker application. Uh, we have the state... Okay. <laughs> uh, was this... Uh, I was reaching the time limit already. Eh? <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, that, was, that was a polite warning. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> In emergency situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have the state's information gateway or website called esti.ee. Uh, it's like estonia.ee. Uh, where all the state uh, services are gathered together and which everyone can access um, with their ID card. And uh, there, for example, a person can renew his driver's license, register a childbirth or place of residence, etc. Uh, from there, you can uh, also use the data tracker to see who has viewed your data in the state-owned database. Uh, and if you have any question, questions why someone has looked uh, at your data, then you can uh, already contact the res responsible data processor of the database. So uh, that's how the transparency <coughs> is um, uh, offered uh, uh, from the uh, data exchange of those databases. But the um, lessons which we learned during this uh, crisis, uh, that um, legislation must uh, be well thought out. Uh, states uh, should be ready for emergencies, not only materially, but also legally. Uh, fundamental rights such as privacy must be respected even during the emergencies and uh, fundamental rights such as privacy can be infringed only by law, not by DPA's permission. So, thank you. Thank you, Pila. Although it's not the topic of, uh, of our discussion, um, you are also responsible for freedom of information, the two sister rights. I would say the, the two sides of the same coin, because both are protecting the weaker party against the information superpowers. And so uh, did you have any, any issues or any, any cases regarding uh, emergencies and uh, people's privacy and freedom of versus freedom of information? Maybe journalists wanted to know more about uh, personal data and statistics and all other things which were not public at that time. Yeah, we, we have this struggle not only during the emergencies or crisis, but like every day to, to find this balance between the, the protection of the 
uh, privacy and uh, uh, and personal data and at the same time to provide uh, the uh, public information but uh, it's um, uh, still um, I mean the, the fr um, uh, to the protection of the uh, privacy or, or personal data um, for me it's like a, on a higher level than the, the access to the public information so it's uh, but there was a lot of pressure of course during yes. the crisis as okay. well okay yeah. thank you a new round of voting uh, the question is the uh, the following you may say that you don't have enough information to answer these questions or vote for these questions but you can still have an opinion on this so the question is what types of organizations are DPAs best able to consult in emergencies? Option one, national and local government authorities for emergency relief. For example, police, fire departments, rescue, medical agencies. Option two, international organizations like United Nations agencies, EU agencies. Option three, civil society organizations such as charities that provide relief, food, shelter. So those of you who think that DPAs uh, are best able to consult with national and local government authorities, please raise your hand. Option one. Majority. It's a majority, slight majority, yes. Option two, international organizations. None. Uh, option three, civil society organizations. Perhaps I would go, yeah, okay, then two, two and a half, let's say. Okay, thank you. Now, um, <coughs> Zoe, uh, it will be your turn, but uh, let me also ask a warming up a question. When we were exchanging our uh, mobile telephone number when organizing the panel, we were joking about purpose specification, but we took it seriously, but we made jokes. In, uh, in your opinion, in, a, in an emergency situation, can the principle of purpose specification or finality, in other words, be observed at all? Yes, it can be. And I'm going to speak about that. OK. <laughs> OK, I found out <laughs> your, your secret plans. So, so floor is yours. So exactly. I'm going to focus on the key role of the legislation and of the legislator. And thereby, I'm going to complement. I'm going to uh, complement Peel in what she said that in some situations, the Estonian DPA couldn't allow the uh, processing even in emergency because there was no legal basis there. So, as you know, also the Commission has um, in the EU law the legislative uh, initiative. So this means it proposes legislative measures, but it does not adopt um, these measures. This is the parliament. Can you hear me? Is it OK? OK. So it's the parliament and the council. In some times, it, the commission also uh, adopts legislation, which is this secondary legislation, like implementing decisions, which have a legal basis already in a directive or a regulation. I'm insisting on that because having a legal basis, as we already heard, is important. Mm. And also, of course, Commission facilitates uh, cooperation and best coordination amongst member states in various areas of policy. So therefore, I'm going to talk here about measures initiated by the Commission on uh, to gradually lift COVID-19 um, uh, restrictions in, um, in movement and also uh, measures to address the COVID uh, um, threat to the health. Um, already, uh, less, uh, in less than uh, one month, uh, uh, the Commission, on eight, uh, eight, uh, one month after the, we had the lockdown here in Belgium, uh, the Commission announced that it will support the Member States in their efforts to fight the virus and develop an exit strategy and be uh, attentive and recover in full respect of fundamental rights. GDPR is the golden standards. Uh, Let's see how. 
So on the same day, it also published a recommendation, a toolbox for the uh, tracing and warning uh, apps that they were making their way uh, down to the users. So where identified security measures um, and how the whole processing should take place. And it was also at that, at that time also important or the, I mean, the policy makers found important to have data uh, that can help them to confine the virus and see how the virus moves. So this was the so-called mobility data. And uh, there, the Joint Research uh, um, Center of the Commission collected data centrally from the various telco providers, but in aggregated and anonymized form. And in that recommendation, measures were taken and um, uh, uh, put in place how this data should remain anonymized and non-identifiable. And if on the other side, it would be a risk for re-identification, uh, re what uh, uh, um, its actor should do in that case. So for instance, the JRC to notify the telco providers of any accidentally processed data capable of identifying an individual. A second example is the commission guidance on, um, uh, on these mobile apps that has been adopted also in the same month, so in April again, 2020. There, I mean, the commission, and it was also uh, there, the unit where I have worked, gave uh, uh, guidance on what is the legal basis for the mobile apps. Why, for instance, the e-privacy, how e-privacy directive applies? Do we need consent for storing information on the mobile app or accessing information stored in the mobile app? Yes, we need. What national authorities collecting health data need, they need a legal basis in their national law. What kind of identifiers should be used to have the most privacy-friendly solution? So at that time, it was chosen that this Bluetooth energy, low energy codes that um, um, are the most friendly and less telling data. So uh, the purpose of contact tracing could be pursued with this data, and this data were by default pseudonymous data. I mean, this is only examples. They were more measures on various aspects to exactly maintain the data protection a key in these situations. Another example is uh, that then the, I mean, the member states, most of them, they developed national mobile apps. But then these national mobile apps, they had uh, to communicate to each other. And the user, if wanted to travel, didn't need to uh, have several mobile apps that would also create collisions in the smartphone, but could travel with its own national app. How was this enabled? It was enabled by this so-called EU interoperability gateway, which is based um, on the Commission's implementing act. So there is there a legal basis. There it was defined what kind of data should be communicated to this gateway in order to be accessed by the national authorities of the other member states. And this is... <clears throat> Um, this was important so that it is only the necessary data to be communicated. What are the roles of the various national uh, member states authorities? So we consider that there is a joint controllership there. What is the role of the commission? The commission has been a processor establishing the infrastructure, the platform. And then uh, another example. You may remember that after a time, the member states, when we were traveling, they have requested this, the, to fill in, uh, in advance, the passenger locator forms. So, and then, because they needed that for contact tracing purposes, but then the question arose, how to help when we have cross-border 
passengers. Well, the contact tracing can start in the member state that a passenger, a tourist, arrives, yes, where the passenger has been found infected, but then this passenger may leave or may have been in contact during travel with others, and the others have, however, traveled in to another end destination. So for this, we needed, again, a formula, an exchange, what we called EU exchange platform for P, uh, passenger locator forms to enable this cross-border exchange to address a cross-border threat to public health. There we have established a legal basis for this implementing decision. And a very big challenge was to identify which data are necessary and are the most limited to make this tracing and with which member states this data must be shared. And there are various, there are two cases in this implementing decision. Everything is there described. We can come uh, back to this if there are more questions. But, <clears throat> um, of course, again, here we had the joint controller situation, so we had to define who is the joint controller for which processing operations, meaning processing operations only from the entry in the gateway up to the time that the data leaves the gateway, because for all the other processing operations, each member state was sole controller. This is also all important to allocate responsibilities. And we have also defined the role <clears throat> there, not of the commission, but it was the center for uh, the uh, prevention and control of uh, communicable diseases. Finally, the same, I mean, uh, what you mo probably most of you know is the digital COVID certificate. This is based on a regulation that was adopted in a rapid time and was initiated, I mean, the, there the proposal has been adopted, of course, by the commission. There again, all these elements that I was mentioning, so the, that time, this uh, time, like legal basis, what data, what data fields, for which purpose, all are these established in the regulation. For instance, the purpose there, it's only to enable the free movement. If the member states, they wanted to, uh, I mean, uh, define further purposes, they should have done this on the basis of their national legislation. What is also important uh, there, how was the, because then you, this digital certificate needed to be verified on authenticity. The measures taken have uh, ensured that in order to check the authenticity, no personal data are, trans are transmitted to the, uh, let's say, central infrastructure. So the authenticity was ensured only by checking the public key of the public authority that has signed the digital certificate. This is also enabled by a public key infrastructure. And to conclude, what we can learn about that, that indeed the, the pandemic necessitated the use of digital tools gave a great push to digitalization and thereby resulted, of course, into increased processing of personal data, however, with a various degree of risk. EU data protection law proved to be flexible and has been upheld in the context of these initiatives. Um, so emergency does not stand against data protection law. But this, however, requires to take data protection seriously while choosing measures and technical solutions to serve and address the identified pressing needs in, let's say, in the society as in a crisis situation. And the devil lies in the details how to draft a law in order to ensure all the data protection principles and obligations. It is good also for the legislator to have working together sectors in the field and data protection, sorry, experts in the sector for which the legislation 
uh, is related to, plus data protection experts, meaning lawyers and IT experts. And, and I'm finishing. Um, we see that in the emergency situations and in the new legislation, often the precautionary principle plays also a role, meaning that amongst possible solutions, it may, we may choose the most cautious one. Why? Not only to respect the law, because the, the law may be respected by various solutions, if all are legal, let's assume. But this also enable, I mean, helps to establish trust in the citizens and hence enables the uptake of the envisaged measures. And finally, consultation of the DPAs at an early stage is also key to ensure compliance. In the COM, for instance, we have the obligation to consult the EDPS, sometimes also the EDPB. But on top of that, we have an informal, uh, let's say, uh, procedure to consult the EDPS and ask for EDPS informal comments at the stage before the adoption of the Commission's proposal. Thank you, Thank Zoe. You. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we may remember, you mentioned the, the IT professionals. It was a very good uh, exercise for them because they developed different protocols, technical protocols. Some of them uh, could be called uh, proximity tracing rather than contact tracing. Yeah. And, uh, but we don't have time to go into this uh, detail. Let's vote again. In your opinion, do DPAs consult with each other about protecting data in emergencies? Three options again. Yes, they harmonize their position. Option two, no. They concentrate on their own jurisdiction and powers. Option three, they rely primarily on the advice and the initiatives or of international data protection boards, such as the EDPB that uh, you also mentioned. So who votes for option one? Thank you. None. So they don't harmonize their position. Option two, they concentrate on their own jurisdiction. Almost everybody. Yes, option three, they rely on international boards, a minority. OK, thank you. Now uh, I turn uh, to Chloe. In your opinion, again, a warming up question, if I may. Um, <clears throat> You are from the, from the civil sector. In your opinion, is the civil sector um, uh, the, uh, treats, uh, uh, treating the DPAs as, um, as uh, is the civil sector criticizing the DPAs rather than working with them as allies in emergency situations? Ooh, Again, it's a tricky question. Um, Perhaps both, but which one is more important? I think European? both. We we do provide advice when uh, because we we also have experts and we have people working on those issues. So we do provide advice, but we're also there to express the critical voice when decisions are made, and we think the those are bad decisions. We have both roles. <laughs> okay, the floor is yours. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Uh, I will focus my presentation on uh, the migration field, the migration policies. I think that hasn't been touched so, uh, upon so, so far in the panel. Uh, Charles mentioned it as one of the emergency situations that can arise. Um, and then try to see where the role of data protection lies in there and, and the enforcers of data protection. Um, it, it is a bit of a a dif different emergency situation than the ones that we typically have in mind. I mean, the temporality of this emergency uh, is not a usual one. I mean, for, for the other, like when you look at the definition of emergency, it's urgent, it's dangerous situation, and it has also the char characteristics to be um, unexpected. Um, and also limited in time. You can, you can tell there is an end, there is a beginning. For the migration so-called crisis is a bit different. And the, 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 cons, the cause of this is because precisely the inadequate response of the political makes it a long-lasting emergency. So the absence of political solutions that really like serve the problems 
that resolve the problem on the ground and the dire pressing needs that we see in these humanitarian situations, they are lacking. Uh, and they have been very much lacking for a long time. We are very much stuck at scale, um, square one since um, the kind of so-called reception crisis uh, in 2015 and um, starting even earlier. Um, why does data protection plays a role in this uh, context? Is because technologies um, have become really a key feature of the EU's approach to migration. Um, this can be seen and illustrated in a various uh, in various ways, but it can be really like um, drawn uh, along the path of migration that that migrants follow when they attempt to, to uh, join uh, Europe. You have surveillance infrastructure being deployed and developed at the borders um, with cameras, drones, high-tech infrastructure in hotspots. Those are increasingly um, being deployed um, and recurring in the recurring situation. We have even like um, AI lie detectors, which is becoming a thing in the process of immigration procedures. Um, as well as risk profiling tools that rely on algorithmic uh, systems. Uh, the use eventually of predicting uh, al analytic system to forecast migration patterns. And although that seems quite innocuous, I mean, statistics about where people come, where they go, that sounds really innocent. But actually, there is a clear concern and pretty much confirmed concern that this can be used to facilitate illegal pushback, pullbacks, and other ways to prevent people from exercising their right to seek asylum. Obviously, the EU has a big role to play in the development of all of this through funding, through development programs, through supporting member states in, in all of this, but they also run their own large-scale IT systems. Um, those huge databases where people data are stored for many, many years, uh, and they're accessible to a large range of public authorities, immigration authorities for once for sure, but also law enforcement authorities more and more. Um, those two measures, and those are only two uh, examples I'm giving, are already criticized by the DPAs themselves as having been not proven as necessary and proportionate. So there's already a problem there in terms of how the EU says one thing on one hand about the kind of typical standards that we set for ourselves in data protection and how we apply them when it comes to migrants and racialized people that comes to our borders. Um, the fact that those systems are interconnected or makes it also more difficult to understand for um, authorities that are supposed to oversee them and also for, to control how data is accessed is being used in a variety of different situations. Um, the fact that we also have a blending of all the multiple purposes that those databases are serving, like visa application registration, asylum claims registration and processing, makes it very, uh, like leads to a blurring of lines between migration on one side and migration control and law enforcement. We are really seeing like each database absorbing each other's purposes. And that is really problematic from a data pr protection point of view because the key principle of data protection includes purpose limitation, includes um, the, the, the principle, like the requirement that data, uh, personal data involved in the processing must be adequate, must be necessary, limited to what is absolutely necessary to achieve the purposes. Lastly, there is control on the ground because those databases don't run in the vacuum, in the void. They're also meant to be used by local police. Um, notably, those police are being equipped with technologies that can serve um, the, the political objective to increase the number of people identified as undocumented within the borders of uh, the EU through police stops. Uh, and that, obviously, for civil society is a huge problem because that perpetuates uh, racial profiling that we see in the uh, phenomenon of stop and searches. In France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, we have police being equipped um, with fingerprinting material uh, to stop on the streets people and check their immigration status. 
Um, so all these form a very large um, apparatus of surveillance for us, um, which is developed at the borders and within the borders of Europe. And so where do DPAs fit into these pictures, really? Um, first, the, the kind of first remarks or first reaction, observation we have as civil society is that they seem overtaken by reality all the time. Because why? The correct, one of char the characteristic of this surveillance <laughs> ecosystem is that it is being developed under the pretext of mostly experimentation. Uh, we experiment. We do research, we do pilots, we do informal cooperation networks between authorities and test things out. Which means that those deployments are not following the typical kind of process of a legislation where there is debate, um, parliament is involved, authorities are involved, like they are consulted prior. But in many, many cases, our organizations on the ground have been noticing that police, immigration authorities are starting ahead with the practice without informing and consulting this. That happened in Greece, that happened in uh, Germany, it happened in many, many countries uh, we follow as a network. Um, and then suddenly the DPA realized or is informed either by, uh, via the press or via our organizations, and they're like, oh, you didn't consult us, and you didn't do a data protection impact assessment, by the way, uh, so please do that. Too late, the infrastructure is in place, it's already in the hands uh, of officers on the ground. Second, it feels like the APAs are a bit powerless in the field of migration, and the ramping surveillance deployment that we see to control people on the move. Um, the tools that data protection offers as principles, as rights, this seems inadequate to, resp to respond to um, the, the trends we see in the migration field, which are criminalization of migrants, which are dehumanization trends. And so the window in which they can really act is very narrow. It's like, ah, you can exercise your individual rights to access to rectification. Your name was misspelled in this database, but you will remain in the database for 10 years, even though it's not proportionate and necessary. So what do they do? What do we observe them to do? So they, first, they advocate and they raise alarm, which is good. I mean, good, good on them. Um, they try to resist, so DDPS is doing op-eds in the press to say like, hey, we have a migration issue. Um, they really stand forward about like, we don't want to criminalize migrants. We don't see this trend as very positive. And really, I'm gonna quote him, he said, we will, if we don't do anything, we will continue to hear alarming reports on organized pushbacks, on the persecution of NGO activists, and on excessive EU money spending for building what some call the fortress Europe. They try to do some lobbying, just as we do. <laughs> Um, this is also the case of more formal groups, DDPS on one side, but also the Eurodac uh, co Supervisory co Coordination Group, which sends regularly letters to the European Parliament warning about the reforms of various databases. Um, Eurodac for one. Um, they raise serious concerns all the time. Um, they raise questions about the principle of purpose limitation of data subject rights and the ability of data protection authorities to fulfill the task because the reform set by their legislators are not going to help them in that. And so they acknowledge that the issue go way beyond their competence. For example, I quote again the Eurodac um, supervisory coordination group. They stressed that a possib uh, the possibility, um, sorry, that important issue in terms of fundamental rights go way beyond personal data protection consideration. And secondly, what they do is to ask for ancillary conditions and safeguards, um, so detailed uh, privacy and data protection assessment, and they propose guidance to individuals. So they do roadmap for data subjects, uh, like, oh, where is your data going? You can find them in this database, that database, you have this recourse, this form, and so on. Um, I'm gonna conclude by saying that uh, it's important that we don't stop at the pure data protection issues and that we are trying to actually put into question the overall policy that is supporting those systems and the deployment of technologies in this field and that we need to put into question this logic 
underpinning the EU asylum system and migration system. My question would be, what is the role of data protection to counter this regime of exceptionalism? Thank you, Chloe. Um, <clears throat> you made very important and very strong points. I wish we had more time to discuss all this. But now, the last ch your last chance to vote during this session. In your opinion, RDP is able to publicize their opinion on data protection in, in emergencies in the mainstream or social media? One, yes, the media is willing to show the dangers of infringing privacy rights in emergencies. Option two, no, the media is only committed to showing casualties and people in need. Option three, it's a bit more balanced, the question already, where there is a balanced, diverse media, the chances are better to present the importance of protecting people's privacy in emergencies. Who votes for option one? I can't see. I can't see anyone. OK. So the media is not willing to do so. OK. Option two, the media is committing to showing casualties and things like it. Who votes for this? One. Thank you. And who votes for option three? Balanced media is absolutely important. OK, I think we agree. So I stole the microphone for certain purposes, but I could do it uh, without. So I give it back. So that's uh, the Q&A session. Your questions and, uh, and opinions and comments. Michael, first. Yeah, I would like to come back to, uh, to the first two rounds of, of votes, obviously. There is a problem in uh, um, uh, trans or international uh, corporations, and there seems to be a problem on the side of CSOs. I'm not so much thinking about the big charities, so Red Cross is probably not having a, a very big problem, though we had studies a couple of years ago on uh, data protection and such uh, things. But I'm thinking more of, of, of the things uh, that pop up as a grassroots movement. Uh, I remember some 10 years ago, um, in, after the earthquakes in Haiti, um, uh, volunteer groups uh, organizing spontaneously with the help of, of uh, a self-developed uh, um, uh, peer uh, um, uh, communicating uh, applications, collecting uh, data probably completely uncontrolled and uh, without any consent uh, to coordinate uh, a first, uh, um, first ADA uh, uh, initiatives um, is something like that on, on the radar of, of the DPAs, uh, things that come up from the grassroots and trying to help people in cases in, uh, of emergency um, in a very quick way, other than the COVID things, which all took time, though it was quite, quite uh, fast uh, uh, indeed. Uh, but that, that seems to be a, a very valuable uh, a part of, of the um, uh, emergency reaction uh, possibilities, uh, but seems to be completely uh, out of scope for, for data protection. Thank you. Unfortunately, we won't have much time left, so uh, because there will be another panel, yes, occupying our place. So your very quick and short reaction to what you heard from your fellow presenters and also uh, a response uh, to Michael Friedewald. So, Pille first. If you have. Um, okay. Um, how to conclude and uh, what to say? I, I, I think that um, uh, the criticism that we don't, maybe we don't have uh, enough the cooperation between the different EPAs is uh, actually correct. Uh, and during the, the previous crisis, uh, I also, I, I tried to ask some opinion from my colleagues. And uh, from the closest one, I got the answer, but uh, the, uh, who were more far away, they, they didn't answer. So it's, it's uh, I think we should have. Uh, and now we have the, another crisis, at least in, in our countries, in this region, uh, very related to the migration. And, uh, and there are also, um, I heard from the, our police and uh, border board that uh, 
uh, they are lacking of uh, platforms where to exchange data and we cannot um, forget that uh, uh, there are not only you know the refugees or migrants who really have a problem but we do also have a crime there so some people we experience that for example you know the russians try to enter into estonia with a ukrainian passport which costs actually on the on the market 25 euros so it's um, the the need to exchange between the different countries and co cooperate between the dpas is is uh, even more in focus than uh, maybe uh, before that unfortunately we oh, we have no more time only for charles <laughs> last words he, he doesn't want, okay. I have no last words, I think. Could we have one more question at least? Um, uh, a very short question, yes, and uh, a very short answer, if, if I may. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask for your views, maybe Charles Robb in particular, on comments that the Irish DPC made. Sorry, I can't hear you too well because of it. Okay. Um, in the DPC's decision in relation to Meta's data transfers, there were comments about Article 49. And the DPC said, in effect, the law in the US has been found to breach the essence of data protection. Derogations under Article 49 cannot empty a provision of all meaning. This means that you cannot use derogations under Article 49. And that, that seems to me to be problematic because the derogations are there to allow transfers in appropriate exceptional situations. But the limits of how you draw that is not entirely clear, which seems to me very much on point for the topics you've been raising. So I'd be interested in where you draw those boundaries there. I don't have a view on that. Uh, it is Ruth, isn't it? Yeah, Ruth, hi. I don't have a view on that, but I can refer you. I mentioned the re report done by Fordham University on missing persons. They also have an advisory report on Article 49. Uh, you can find this uh, if you look under um, CLIP, which is the Fordham University uh, Center. Uh, if you are in trouble with that, just uh, ping me and I can give you the reference to it. I don't, uh, I have it with me in my computer, but uh, I don't have an opinion on it. But they were proposing a form of words for Article 49. Uh, this is before the uh, GDPR was set. Uh, a form of words which they thought should be adopted to cover, I think, that kind of point. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we need to stop here. Uh, we don't finish our discussion, simply stop because of the lack of time. I thank all the panelists. Thank you for your active participation, voting, and uh, goodbye.